Jesus Christ Superstar is one of my favorite movies on the life of Jesus, strangely enough. It's also an incredibly rich theological study, and I've never once heard anybody talk about it. No big introduction today because I want to dive right into the film. Believe it or not, the secret to seeing this film's deep theological and societal philosophy is by taking it extremely literally. Most of you probably see this film as very abstract, hence the time period is an anachronism, with no set time frame. But actually, this is the secret, I think, to Norman Jewison's genius. Norman Jewison was the director and creative vision behind many of my favorite films. And if you've seen any of his other movies, you might expect that there is going to be a couple of things that are a little bit odd in this film, if you've never seen Jesus Christ Superstar. Here's just a few of Norman's great films, and you'll probably have heard of at least a few of them. The Thomas Crown Affair, In the Heat of the Night, The Cincinnati Kid, Send Me No Flowers, The Hurricane, Moonstruck, Agnes of God, and of course, probably his most famous, arguably, is Fiddler on the Roof. If you only know one of these films, you're going to have some idea of why he was such a great talent. Now, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber were the lyricist and composer of the musical, respectively. They did not much like his adaptation to film. They did not like this movie very much at all. In fact, in 2000, they did a recording of the stage production, which they said was far closer to what they had in mind for a movie version of Jesus Christ Superstar. I would like to suggest maybe it was because they saw the musical as being a literal retelling of Christ's story, set in the modern day. However, Norman Jewison clearly did not. I'm going to state my interpretation simply and outright to begin this video. That way you can understand it easier because I have to over explain a couple of these points for the sake of clarity because there's not really a good way of phrasing them. This is not a film about the life of Jesus Christ. This is a film of a play of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't mean this is an adaptation. I mean the film is meant to be seen by the audience as a play being put on in the desert by actors and being filmed. We are not meant to see these characters as themselves. Instead, we are meant to see the actors as characters. Re uh, let me rephrase that. The actors are playing actors playing characters. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Ah, thank you, RDJ. Absolutely correct. This is probably obvious to a lot of you, as I certainly can't have been the only one to put this theory together. However, some of you may not have realized this, and so this video is for you. The breakthrough with how I watch this film came when I was watching the DVD commentary. I've long since lost my DVD because I mainly watch this through my Amazon account where I own it digitally. So, And I also can't find the commentary anywhere on YouTube. So if you can find it, listen to it. In the first little bit, you'll hear Norman Jewison say this, and this is what put me onto this interpretation. They were talking about the bus scene. At the very beginning of the movie, all of the actors drive out into the Israeli desert and disembark from a bus, bringing out all of their costumes and props, and they start dressing up to get ready to film the movie. During the scene, Norman says, and I paraphrase, I wanted to show a bunch of young actors getting off the bus to put on a play. In an interview, Ted Neely reiterates this by saying, Norman didn't want us to be seen as Mary or Judas or Jesus. He wanted people to see that we are actors playing these parts. So to reiterate, this is not a movie about Jesus Christ. It's a movie about young people in a society putting on the play of Jesus Christ. I've often heard Christians say this musical mocks Jesus. Now, I hope with this interpretation to change your mind on that. However, I disagree with it on the outset because nowhere in the stage show does it say that Jesus was not who he said he is. In fact, later, to, the, the lyrics were changed in the stage show to make that even clearer. Lines such as, God, thy will is hard, but you hold every card, being changed to, God, thy will be done, kill your only son. 
which makes it far clearer that this musical is acknowledging, at least within universe, that Jesus is, is the Son of God. Annas and Caiaphas, uh, among other ones of the Pharisees, acknowledge several times the claims of Jesus performing miracles. Herod does the same thing. Now, they believe, because they do not believe in him, that these were magic tricks. However, they never once deny that those miracles happened. I will go on to explain, as we're going through the film, why some of the more controversial parts don't bother me and how I see some of them as actually being strengths, but I'd like you to just suspend... If this film is something you see as mocking Jesus, please suspend your offense and suspend your disbelief for just the hour or so that it'll take me to lay out this theory. And then I want you to come back and watch the film and give it another chance because I think you'll find more to be appreciated. Uh, I think there's actually a deeply religious message to this film that is easy to overlook. I mean, deeply religious besides the fact that it's about Jesus. But my primary focus for this film is going to be the 1973 film, not the stage show, which I will clearly state one more time is not about Jesus. It's about young people in the society. A society that is questioning its core belief, Christianity. If you want proof, just listen to Norman making the comparison between the stage show and the film. I think he characterized some of the characterizations were a little uh, offensive. Um, I'm not doing the Broadway show. I'm making a film. Remember that the hippie movement and the New Age movement, they stemmed from questioning Western society. Of course, one of the pillars of Western society, inarguably, is Christianity. Remember that the ideals of compassion, self-sacrificial, agape love, and care for the disabled, sick, and poor were all primarily Judeo-Christian ideas that informed the Western culture and formed it into what it was. There was no eye-for-an-eye mentality supposed to be coherent within that philosophy. But of course, we have to acknowledge, and this film I think does a good job of acknowledging, that a lot of negative things came out of Christianity informing the West, too. For instance, rampant anti-Semitism, because the Jews, quote-unquote, killed Jesus. Now, if you're a, a, a Christian who comes to the Bible with an open heart, you know this is preposterous. The Romans and the Jews were standing in for all humanity. To paraphrase one of my favorite nonfiction books of all time, The Truth and Beauty by Andrew Clavin, we all killed Jesus because that's who we are. We kill the truth. And the truth had to be resurrected because that's who the truth is. It never dies. Norman also clearly was not uh, trying to say anything anti-Semitic from the film either, despite the fact that there were some protests, as there typically is among Americans. There's been a certain attacks on the property, but most of those attacks have taken place in America. We have had really no no protests from any Jewish groups in England or any Jewish groups here. I don't see how, I don't find the opera anti-Semitic. Uh, I don't see how it can be anti-Semitic since all the characters are Jewish. So when the film begins, the characters are getting off a bus. And we can assume that they are not, in fact, characters at all, but actors playing actors playing characters. Or actors playing themselves in some sort of alternate variation. As the props are unloaded from the bus, and we hear the awesome overture playing, one of Andrew Lloyd Webber's best pieces of music in my opinion, some characters like Judas and Pilate are highlighted by zoom-ins to emphasize their importance. This is good visual storytelling and good foreshadowing, because in the end, Pilate, Mary, and Judas are the only ones who seem really changed by the events of the film, but I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Ted Neely steps briefly into shot, dressed for the only time in the film in normal clothing. We see Judas leaving off by himself before cutting back to a wide shot as Ted stands in the middle of the whole cast, putting on the robe of Jesus, stretching his arms heavenward as uh, the music swells. We see that putting on the garb has an illuminating effect. By putting on the character of Jesus, Ted has received some sort of enlightenment. A tableau shot closes the overture, a picture of Western society. Actors, 
trying to play ancient roles, standing within the ruins of a society that came before them. It's interesting that the film is one of the only Jesus movies ever filmed in Israel. This was important to Norm Jewison, and I think this is why. It's literally the actors returning to the source to find the truth behind the story. We see Judas sitting on the mountain alone, singing to himself. Controversy 1. Judas is black. Norman Jewison met some fire initially for casting Carl Anderson as Judas, while Jesus is played by a white man. Now, let's be very clear. Carl went to Norman directly and asked him if he had only been cast because he was black. Norman said emphatically, no, his color had nothing to do with it. And Carl said that was good enough for him because they were all friends and he, he really respected Norman and trusted that that was the truth. There's not really any reason to think Norman Jewison was in any way racist. Uh, again, going back to the Jewish element, the man did make Fiddler on the Roof, which, I mean, just look at it. It's a movie that glorifies Jewishness to a uh, to, to an almost comical degree. I mean, it glories, glories, it relishes in the tradition. <laughs> and, and I just don't think there's an anti-Semitic bone in Norman Jewison's body. But I also don't think there's a racist bone in his body either. I, I really just don't see the point. And, and, and also, I'll just say, when Norman Jewison says he cast Carl Anderson because he was the best man for the job, I'm just going to play a little clip, not enough to get me copyright flagged, but just a little clip so you can see Carl Anderson's voice. Yeah, no one else could have played this role. He was totally hired because he was the absolute best freaking option you could ever choose. I have seen this show on stage many times. I have seen more casts of this show than probably any other stage show. And I'll tell you what, I have never seen a Judas that I like better. Carl Anderson was a once in a generation talent. One of my very favorite singers of all time. And his voice is is so unbelievably expressive and you never get the full power of his voice in his own music. The music that Carl wrote and produced and recorded separately, the other things that he was in where he was singing other people's music, his voice is so powerful and you never see the power of his voice like you do in the role of Judas. On that note, if you're a fan of Carl Anderson's performance in this film, go and look up on YouTube the recording of him singing the song Gethsemane because he does an incredible job. I would have loved to have seen him play Jesus at some point on stage. Sadly, uh, Carl died uh, uh, several years ago now, uh, tragically. And if you go on Ted Neely's Facebook page, you can tell that these two men were like joined at the soul brothers, you know, like literal soul brothers, like... Ted clearly has never gotten over the death of Carl Anderson. He constantly posts about Carl Anderson and keeps his memory alive. It's really beautiful. Judas sings that after reflection, he realizes where we are all going. He says the line, quote, If you strip away the myth from the man, you will see where we all soon will be. He thinks Jesus has bought his own advertising. So when he says you will see where we all soon will be, he's saying there is no heaven. There is no kingdom. All of it is a false promise. A cult of personality built up around him, which means more than his philosophy. Many have criticized the show for this too, saying that because the story is primarily from Judas's point of view, he's implied to be correct on this. But that makes no sense. In fact, you would never use that standard on any other movie. Nobody watches Dr. Strangelove and says, oh, well, the government must be correct because they're the main framing device. No, that's, that's a ridiculous concept. You literally would never use that logic with any other type of film. Judas is expressing concerns that his character has. He does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and so he thinks Jesus is getting full of himself and letting the movement that he has inspired spiral out of control. This isn't much different than the real Jesus' family, who thought he had gone mad. 
Now, also remember our interpretation. This is an actor playing Judas within the film's universe. He represents a stripe of society that wants to label Jesus as just another religious teacher who got crucified. He's also expressing worry for his friend, not Jesus, remember, but Ted. Ted has become Jesus to these actors by putting on the robe. Before you say I'm reading too much into this, think about it. When a person converts, Judas's reaction is not atypical. Friends are often worried that their friend who is a new convert might take their religiosity too far and alienate others, or even alienate themselves uh, from their friends by running with a new crowd who maybe is a little overzealous, and some people do exactly that. As he continues, he states, Listen, Jesus, do you care for your race? Don't you see we must keep in our place? We are occupied. Have you forgotten how put down we are? Obviously, this line does not paint Judas in a great light, but it does show his motivation is survival, not revolution. He continues, I'm frightened by the crowd, for we are getting much too loud, and they'll crush us if we go too far. This was a common feeling, especially in the 1970s, and it's not unrelatable today, with authorities seeking to come down on new movements and counter-government, counter-war movements, like the hippie uh, generation, who had sprung up in counter to the wars. Many people also disagreed with the war, but tried to quiet the crowds anyway. We're getting much too loud, we're getting too noticeable, and they, they will come down on us. Remember, that's, again, not an unfounded fear. Nixon actually used the war on drugs as a way of targeting hippies and blacks uh, because that was, the, that was the easy way to, uh, to, to do it without causing any scandal. <laughs> not that Nixon would know anything about scandal, am I right? As he shouts his warnings to Jesus to listen to him, and eventually devolves into crying, he won't listen to me, we crane out showing that he is on top of a mountain where he started. However, the group of the apostles uh, and Jesus himself have moved further away. Visually, this shows that Judas's principles are the same, but the group is moving in a different direction. Now, again, this is not a bad thing. It doesn't mean Judas is right. It means he came to Jesus expecting one type of Messiah and got another. I cover this in my video, The Barabbas Choice, where I do a scene analysis from Jesus of Nazareth, starring Robert Powell. But most Jews imagined the Messiah as a militant, Barabbas-like figure, not a peaceful one, and certainly not one claiming to be God himself, or at least not the literal Son of God. But in Norman Jewison's beautiful symbolic retelling of this musical, we can see Judas as an actor representing the average modern non-Christian. Judas regularly asks questions that non-believers and questioning theists ask. His entire characterization, I would say, represents Western culture questioning itself, which is what I'm arguing in this video is the main theme of the film. Next we see Jesus and his followers literally meeting underground. <laughs> nice visual. Here we see Ted Neely singing, quoting Jesus's, uh, or some of Jesus' essential teachings. Don't worry about tomorrow, God will provide. And peaceful revolution is the answer, not violent revolution. The people continually question, what's the buzz? Tell me what's a happening, repeatedly. And this represents the people never being satisfied with Jesus' words, never accepting them and always wanting more. They want to know the future. They want to know, uh, for instance, uh, to quote the, the rich man who comes to Jesus, exactly what acts do I have to perform? Uh, when are we going to overthrow the Romans? But Jesus' words are often plain, straightforward, and yet no one can understand them. That's why Jesus spoke in parables, because it was really the only way some people could understand him. Ted is also a little bit agitated, as you can tell, with the group not understanding the philosophy of Jesus. He's trying to get them to understand the, the character that he's playing to get them also to play the character of Jesus, to join him in the role. However, it comes, it flies over their heads, and that's why they're playing the characters they are. Start off with no knowledge, and to quote Jesus, no eyes to see with and no ears to hear with. But that isn't to say they're devoid of hope. They can learn, and some of them by the end do. Mary wipes his face with cold water to cool down Jesus, and Jesus rebukes them, uh, the whole lot of them, saying, Mary is the only one who is taking care of me while you're fretting and arguing over your dinner. 
Judas enters and <laughs> I just want to point out how Simon the Zealot just lights up when Judas enters. Like he's so happy to see him. It's, it's really adorable. Judas points out how strange it is that Jesus teaches righteousness, but hangs out with a prostitute like Mary. Suddenly, Jesus tenderly touches Mary's head to reassure her. Jesus tells Judas that if his slate is clean, then he can throw stones. That's a tongue twister. I don't know, it took me like eight takes to get that line out. <laughs> Otherwise, he is not to think of himself as better than Mary. Clearly, the questioning of Jesus' choice in friends and even the insinuation that Mary and him have a relationship is upsetting to Ted. It's where he draws the line and will not let Judas keep going on this path. Again, I say Ted because I believe at key moments like this, the actors are supposed to be what we are seeing, not the characters. I also think it's funny because the film was criticized by a lot of Christians at the time uh, for insinuating Mary and Jesus were in a relationship, something which the film absolutely does not insinuate. And yet, it seems like the most upsetting thing to Jesus in the whole play is when Judas is acting as though he's accusing Jesus of, of having uh, uh, relations with Mary. Jesus rebukes the crowd of followers, saying, I'm amazed that men like you can be so shallow, thick, and slow. There's not a man among you who knows or cares if I come or go. The crowd replies, No, you're wrong. You're very wrong. Those lyrics always make me laugh. I can't explain why. I also want to point out on a technical level, the fact that all the singing sounds like it is being done live rather than like it was made in a studio. Now, you know that they had to be lip syncing. However, the lip syncing is probably the best lip syncing I have ever seen in a film, in a music video, in anything. The lip syncing is almost flawless. There's a couple times when it shows a little... But, I mean, not much. Not much at all. The audio, however, is just, it's just stripped back to the bare basics. There's not a lot of reverb or echo or, or playing around or fancying it up. It sounds like they are just singing in a room to each other. And the fact that some of the actors are not great singers adds more realism to the idea that this is just a bunch of friends or fellow citizens who just came out to reenact this reality as if they are all aware within universe that they are singing rather than talking. We cut to the Pharisees, Annas and Caiaphas. This is one of my favorite aspects of the film. This song, which is called Then We Are Decided, was written for the film and it humanizes the Pharisees by showing their motivation. I've actually heard people criticize this film for humanizing them and Judas as if they weren't, uh, oh yeah, human. They had motivations, guys. They weren't mustache-twirling villains like the bad guy in Flubber. These were real people. Annas argues that they ought not to get involved and the movement will fizzle out. Caiaphas says that the crowd is proclaiming him king, and this will incite war with the Romans and cause them to destroy the Jewish people, or at best, cause the Jews to believe their leaders have lost their nerve and will allow a blasphemer to go free. Annas reluctantly agrees, but tells Caiaphas to frighten the council, or they won't go along with it. Again, I like this because in the stage show, the Pharisees kind of come out of nowhere, and they really do seem almost offensively mean-spirited, if you know what I mean. After this, we cut back to the tunnels, where Mary is comforting Jesus, telling him not to worry or think about anything negative tonight. It seems everyone is bedding down, and I like Ted's performance, as someone who knows he is about to die for what he believes. No, I don't mean Jesus, but the actor. He knows that to play, Jesus is to die. Again, to quote the truth and beauty, the Logos life is a tragic life from beginning to end. Judas points out that the expensive ointment that Mary pours on Jesus' head and feet to soothe him could have been sold to feed the poor. Mary tries to calm Judas, but Jesus is not having it. He comes back and again, partially quotes the real Jesus. Surely you're not saying that we have the resources to save the poor from their lot. There will be poor always. Then he adds his own interpretation. Look at the good things you've got, Judas. Appreciate and be grateful for what you've got. Jesus did not say that outright, but it does seem to be implied in the scriptures. He tells them to think and act while he's still there because they'll be lost when he's gone. 
Now, in the show, this line was likely because the resurrection is not depicted at the end. Uh, maybe they just didn't want to take a stance on the, the resurrection, and the two writers obviously wanted to humanize Jesus. And uh, I, I really don't know the religious points of view of Tim Rice or Lloyd Webber, so I'm not going to speculate on that. But in this film, with this revisioning of the material, I think that this line is meant to be the actor warning the culture that is play-acting these roles that when they erase Jesus from the culture, they will be lost and sorry for doing it, because there will no longer be any objective grounds for a multitude of the moral stances we take. Ted and Carl really worked hard to create an intimate brotherly bond between Judas and Jesus, and obviously that bond is something they shared in real life. And in this scene, we see the first seeds of that through the two men gripping each other's hands and having a moment when they look into each other's eyes with some understanding that this is an impasse they can't get beyond, that their friendship may be torn apart by this very argument. The Pharisees meet on a scaffolding, a rickety structure, which they've built to tower over the other members of society. It's rickety because their situation is precarious, but also because it represents how authorities as a whole need to look down on the people they subjugate. Now, Pontius Pilate is also seen on a mountaintop when we first meet him. He descends the mountain to meet with the Jews and Jesus. This is to show he towers over them as well, uh, however, there's another element. Remember, the Pharisees stand on a rickety structure made of basically nothing, whereas Pilate stands on a mountain, the mountain of Rome, which is indefeatable at this point in time. On two different side notes, the tapping on the poles during this song is iconic and fun, and I really like that element. And another side note, this guy sounds just like Boris Karloff. What is the deal with that? A rabble-rousing mission that I think we must abort. Caiaphas whips up the Pharisees into a panic. Again, however, we see them talking about Jesus' accomplishments as they happened biblically. Quote, no riots, no fighting, no armies, no slogans, end quote. Somehow Jesus is simply gaining all this glamour and praise from everyone without ever saying the things that most people in captivity want to hear. They conclude that, like John the Baptist, Jesus must die before he can bring about the destruction of the Jewish people. Note, of course, that this is cleverly laid entirely at the feet of the Pharisees, not the actual Jewish people. And that is good. Again, we want to make sure that there is that distinction, because we don't want people getting the wrong idea. The people enter Jerusalem waving palms and singing Hosanna, or Hosanna, Hosanna, Zanna, Zanna, Hosanna. <laughs> the Pharisees tell them to be quiet before it starts a riot, echoing Judas's concern at the beginning of the film. But Jesus tells them that if every voice was still, the rocks and stones themselves would start to sing. I always liked that, despite Ted Neely actually having a really strong, loud, powerful voice, he chose to play Jesus as a soft-spoken and quiet man, except for some key moments where he screams. He tells the audience to keep singing, but not just for him, but for themselves also, because we all have the ability to win the kingdom of heaven. The slow, the suffering, the quick, the dead. Again, I say, how could anyone see this as mocking or belittling Jesus as if he was just another teacher? The concept of the kingdom of heaven makes no sense unless Jesus is the Son of God. The people sing during their song, Hey JC, JC, would you die for me? Then there's a freeze frame on Jesus, as the moment of levity disappears with the remembrance that his death is coming just around the corner. During this song, they call him Superstar, repeatedly. Now maybe Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber had bad intentions when they wrote that, I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate on that. But it never had the effect on me of seeming like it was mocking. I always thought, that it showed how people viewed Christ before the resurrection. He was seen as a miracle man who often scared the crowds away with his controversial teachings like the Bread of Life discourse, but won them back by his teachings of radical love, the hope of a better kingdom, and uh, undoubtedly the miracles, of course the miracles. He was a superstar in his time, 
But in resurrecting, he became recognized by billions as God himself. Not just a passing fad like an actual superstar, but the ultimate representation of the Logos life. After this scene, we have the number Simon Zealot, sang by Simon the Zealot. <laughs> well, how about that? <laughs> the number is very energized, and Larry Marshall, who plays Simon, dances harder than I have ever seen a human being dance. And he does it while singing. He doesn't let that slow him down at all. What a pro. He sings about how Jesus has made it, with over 50,000 people following him. <laughs> Imagine if Jesus had a Twitter. It'd be way more than that. He's as strong as Rome and could overthrow the government. The chorus, sang by everybody, states, Christ, you know I love you. Did you see I waved? I believe in you and God, so tell me that I'm saved. These lyrics at first seemed to me to be very basic and kind of silly and juvenile. But then I started really thinking about how many Christians treat Christianity just like this. Hey God, I love you, I'm following you, I raised my hands in church and professed your name. Now, tell me that I have eternal life and I'm not going to hell, pretty please. Or even, I did all this stuff, Lord, please make my life easy, pretty please, and give me lots of money and a new car and a hot wife. Do you really love him, though? Because if you believe in God, just so he'll tell you you're saved, or bless you in giving you nice things, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like the man who does everything, you know, Jesus says and proselytizes and stuff, but you can just tell, as soon as you get him talking, you just quickly realize that he's just scared to death of hell. He doesn't really love Jesus, or at least with his traditional fire and brimstone, eternal conscious torment interpretation of hell, which he probably inherited from his parents. Notice Simon's words are very nationalistic. Not that having pride in your country is anything bad. I have a lot of pride in my country. But it's not God, is it? It's not about the Jews being God's people. It's about socio-political power to Simon. I know this is very bouncy and goofy musical number to be reading so much into it, but that's the genius. The subtext is hidden under the layer of the presentation. These people are dancing like this in this over-the-top and goofy way because it's meant to show what fools they're making of themselves. I mean, it's the only choreographed dance in the film, if you don't count the, the hand movements of the models at the end when Judas is singing his final song. Even Judas, by the way, when he comes in on the Simon the Zealot number, he looks at them at first like, this is what I was afraid would happen, then his face immediately changes to, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> Roman soldiers start appearing in the background like they're ready to break up a riot. And Simon says the people will do whatever Jesus asks. All he has to do is add a little more hate towards Rome in his message, and Jesus could take over. This makes Ted's face fall as he realizes how Jesus' message has been perverted by warmongers. Jesus quietly sings after the number ends. It's a song called My Poor Jerusalem, and it's probably my favorite part of the film. I'll just recite the lyrics for you so we don't get copyright flagged. Neither you, Simon, nor the 50,000, nor the Romans, nor the Jews, nor Judas, and at this point Judas is walking in the background, he stops when he hears his name, nor the 12, nor the priests, nor the scribes, nor doomed Jerusalem itself, understand what power is, understand what glory is, understand at all. Now this again is pure Jesus, saying that those who measure power and glory in earthly terms do not understand the point of either. God's glory is the only glory. God's power is the only power, which is reiterated to Pontius Pilate later when Jesus says, You have no power over me. Any power you have comes to you from far beyond. Jesus continues, If you knew all that I knew, my poor Jerusalem, you'd see the truth, but you close your eyes. But you've closed your eyes. While you live, your troubles are many, my poor Jerusalem. To conquer death, you only have to die. You only have to die. In response to this, Simon tilts his head in kind of a funny way and looks very confused. Jesus merely stares at him, trying, pleadingly, through his, uh, his expression alone. Ted Neely really is a great actor. I don't know why, no, nobody really gives him attention, but he's a really great actor. And just with that facial expression, you can tell he is really trying to plead with Simon, please understand this, please get it through your head, man. Now this song shows that both... Death is the gateway to the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven when Christ returns to rule, 
but also that dying to yourself, dying daily, as Paul says, uh, it, it's important. That, that is essential. Simon has to die to himself, to die to all the worldly temptations like power and glory and rulership and even the extremity of nationalism. Again, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of national pride. I'm saying the extremes, okay, to conquer the fear of death, even national or racial death, you only have to die. Next, we see Pontius Pilate, who has had a dream. He says the dream was about a Galilean on trial who would not speak to him. Then a crowd who hated the Galilean appeared, fell on him, and disappeared. Next, he dreamt millions of people were crying for this man and leaving Pilate to blame for his death. Pilate's wife appears and gives him his crown, which makes Pilate look terrified, realizing that this crown will lead to to his downfall, the crown that he probably in all other days would have honored and been very grateful to have. Now, in the Gospels, it details that Pilate's wife is actually the one who has this dream, but I don't mind the change for a fictional work because it makes Pilate a more active character. And if we introduced his wife and then never saw her again, even though we could be introducing Pilate instead, it would have been ballooning the cast out of control for absolutely no reason. And musicals have to be personal. The emotions only work if it's personal. By seeing Pilate tortured by this dream, when he comes to the actual trial, we feel some sympathy for him because, in a way, he's kind of like a tragic Greek hero or, or, or Roman hero where he knows his fate, he knows he is doomed, and yet he walks into the trap anyway. Next, we see the temple crowded with vendors of all kinds from all time periods. One lyric in the song is very telling. While your temple still survives, you at least are still alive. This is a little nod to the destruction of the temple that would follow the life of Christ, uh, but it also is a little motivation for what is happening. The business of the temple is paying the bills. They've allowed unfettered commercialism to supersede God. Uh, and that's, uh, that's powerful uh, for our society to hear in the West because we were not always such a commercialized society. We were far more personable uh, before the Industrial Revolution. And God is now no longer providing. Business is providing. Again, the best thing about this production is how it takes traditionally villainous people, the people that we've put cartoon mustaches on, you know, uh, trying try to make them seem like really villains. And it's not to say that they're not doing villainous things, but it's, you see, if we can deperson them, then we can keep them at an arm's length. Oh, the evil Pharisees, they're so bad, I would never be like that. Oh, the evil Romans, they're so bad, I would never do what Pilate did. Oh, those people trading in the temple, I would never partake in that. But the truth is you would. You have to make those people villainous stereotypes so that you can feel better about yourself. But the true freedom, of course, the truth will set you free, as our Lord said, the true freedom comes when you realize, yes, you do have the potential to do that. Yes, if you were living in Germany, you probably would have been, statistically, probably would have been one of the Nazis and not one of the freedom fighters. Humanity, by and large, has a really evil stripe going through all of them, and you are not immune to that. In fact, Carl Anderson actually said this, and I totally agree with him. Well, what we're doing is playing time against time. To, to indicate that what's going on in this film is, is, is something that could happen any place and any time. The Pharisees allow this trade, this commercialism, to run rampant to create a better income for the temple and presumably for themselves. Jesus comes in and turns the tables, scream singing, My temple should be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You have no idea how hard it was for me not to sing that. <laughs> he screams for them to get out, get out! Then, he, I can't help it. Some of this I just got to sing because I, it's so catchy. Uh, <laughs> then we get this awesome shot. Jesus standing sadly alone in the middle of a culture so broken it can no longer distinguish the proper relationship between worship and commerce. It can no longer distinguish the difference between the love of God and the love of money. A culture that is morally bankrupt. And all the while the apostles, especially Judas, look on in confusion. They've never known anything different. But Jesus knows how it's supposed to be. Humanity, morals, and personhood should never be for sale. 
This absolutely destroys Jesus' morale. He walks alone in the desert. And this is a very sudden shot. And I'll address why I think it's so sudden in just a second. He sings uh, uh, a what's sort of a reprise of Gethsemane, except Gethsemane hasn't happened yet. He sings, My time is almost through. Little left to do. After all, I've tried for three years. Seems like 30. He's confronted by strangely creepy looking sick people, normally referred to in the script as lepers. He is filled with compassion and shakes, actually visibly shakes with compassion, almost like it's taking some strain not to break into sobs. They sing lines about hardly being able to walk, hardly being able to move for the pain they're in. One line in particular, quote, see my purse, I'm a poor, poor man, end quote always seemed strange to me beside the other lines about people speaking of how they are masses of blood or their tongues are eaten away by disease and how they can hardly stand or walk. But in hindsight, I've, I've come to realize I think Tim Rice was trying to get across that poverty is like a disease on society. The sick people overwhelm Jesus and pile onto him. He screams for the people to leave him alone. And then he is completely covered. We fade to black then we cut in on Jesus near the sunset, talking to Mary Magdalene, and his posture looks like he's just crushed, just exhausted. She ushers him off to a tent where he can sleep by himself, away from the apostles, and seems to be uh, suggesting with her body language that she will be nearby if he wakes up and needs her. Now, I always thought that this previous scene, where the sick people pile on him, might have been a dream, a nightmarish and haunting reality like this, it seems kind of out of place with the rest of the film. It's almost dreamlike, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, Jesus is just <laughs> alone, randomly, for the first time in the film, after constantly being surrounded by people. Uh, every other time Jesus starts to leave a place, the apostles start to follow him, or they do follow him. The sick people are also crawling out of the rocks like eldritch abominations, and... They're unusually creepy in the way their movements are choreographed. They almost walk. It, it, this is a weird thing, I, I know, but it, they kind of remind me strangely of the creature in Cloverfield, the way some of them walk. Jesus being mobbed while saying in an echoing voice, there's too little of me. And the, the, the again, echoey, dreamlike way that he screams, leave me alone. And there's just no reason for him to be echoing like this. Everybody else is talking as loud as he is, but they're not echoing. And when Jesus comes over to talk to Mary, it implies to me that he might have fallen asleep after the temple incident and woken up from the nightmare and needed Mary to comfort him. Now, that's, that's not obvious from the film. That's me reading into it. So you can take that or leave it. Again, I don't think that you have to believe Jesus would ever scream at people to leave him alone to accept it within the context of this movie because, again, I don't believe this was meant to be the real Jesus. And apparently neither did Ted Neely and, again, Norm Jewison pointed it out himself. So I just don't think we need to go, oh, blasphemy, Jesus would have never said that. I think we need to keep this in context. And I'll give you my theological emphasis from this scene. I think this is not only showing Jesus as a man who was tortured by the knowledge of his death and the the tearing weight of the expectations on him, which I guess you could see on a surface level. But within the film, uh, notice that the people are not being healed when Jesus touches them. And I think that's because of the role. Ted as an actor. Perhaps it represents the overwhelming of a spirit by the horrors of this world. I know more than a few Christians who tell me when they have doubts, and actually all of the atheists I know, who tell me the, the reason they stopped believing in God's existence, actually, is because of the pain and suffering that is so usual and typical of this world. Ted is not being mobbed by a literal group of sick people in poverty, but by the existence of sickness and poverty. He tries to fix it through faith-inspired good works, like James says, you can see the fruits of his actions. He's playing this role with everything he's got in him. Feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, trying to, to, to aid the poor, and sharing his compassion. But he's overwhelmed by his inability to heal the horrors of this world. So he screams out for them to simply leave him alone. 
In this interpretation, Ted would come to Mary as anyone might come to a friend in a time of doubt or despair. But once Mary gets Ted to go to bed, she sings over him to relax him and not think on the things that will disturb him tonight. Then she sings the show's most popular and most controversial number. It's funny that the song really should be so controversial. Let me explain. I Don't Know How to Love Him is a song in which Mary sings about her strange feelings for Jesus. Many, including great fans of the show, have taken this to be a romantic song, leading to Christians throughout the world panicking and going into a mass mob, a stampede, freaking out over the horror, at least before the Da Vinci Code, for some reason, became a success, and then they moved on to, to get mad over that. It's funny to me for two reasons. The first is that Judas later reprises the song with almost no lyrical changes before the bridge. Yet, no one ever claimed Judas was gay for Jesus in this production, and trust me, if the thought ever crossed their minds, they would have put that in there and added it to the controversy hate train. And secondly, because it really has no overtly romantic lines about Jesus. I'm just going to read you the lyrics to the whole song right now. It'll just take a minute. I don't know how to love him, what to do, how to move him. I've changed, yes, really changed. In these past few days, when I've seen myself, I seem like someone else. When she sees the spiritual change in herself, she doesn't understand what has caused it, because she is a physical creature who hasn't developed her spiritual side fully yet. She isn't sure how to care for a man who has led to these changes in her life, because she's never cared for a man emotionally before. Is this the effects of love, or is it something deeper, spiritual? I don't know how to take this. I don't see why he moves me. He's a man. He's just a man. And I've had so many men before in very many ways. He's just one more. So Mary in this production is a prostitute. Now that's not historically accurate. In fact, Mary Magdalene was probably an older woman, probably the widow of a wealthy man because she helped actually finance uh, Jesus's ministry. However, we're just going to ignore the historical inaccuracies and accept the, their interpretation for this analysis uh, because that's what Norm Jewison had to work with. But we'll accept it in this fictional retelling. Mary has obviously been with a lot of men, maybe her whole life. Maybe she was a prostitute from a young age. That wasn't, that wasn't unusual at the time. But she's never been in love before. With no frame of reference, and after a lifetime of being told that she can't have a relationship with God because she had turned to prostitution, presumably in an effort to make a living, she doesn't understand the difference between sexual, romantic, and godly love. You might say deatific love. Should I bring him down? Should I scream and shout? Should I speak of love? Let my feelings out? I never thought I would come to this. What's it all about? Don't you think it's rather funny I should be in this position? I'm the one who's always been so calm, so cool, no lover's fool, running every show. He scares me so. Again, these are all new feelings for Mary, and she has to learn to cope with them and cope with no longer having control of the situation. This is bigger than her. And this lack of understanding scares her. Then, she deliberately does mention romantic love, and this is what she says. Yet, if he said he loved me, I'd be lost. I'd be frightened. I couldn't cope. Just couldn't cope. I'd turn my head. I'd back away. I wouldn't want to know. He scares me so. I want him so. And I love him so. When it comes down to it, she would not want a romantic relationship with Jesus, because somehow she knows that would be too much. There's something inherently different about this entire situation that can't fit into her frame of reference, so she just can't understand what she's feeling. Nowhere, I repeat, nowhere in the musical, and nowhere in this movie does it ever even imply a relationship, a romantic relationship, between Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. It only says 
that Mary doesn't know how to feel about him, and that's really not that unbelievable, people. Many, many folks don't have a frame of reference for godly love, which is why they project so much hatred onto God. Hatred of, of certain groups, for instance. Or some people project their abusive parents onto God. Subconsciously, they need somebody to fear as a parental figure in adulthood. You know, and that's why there's so many people who they don't, they do not love God. They don't even like God. They just have God around to scare the crap out of them. As a Christian, I always loved this song. It relates to my own conversion. How do you love God when you never knew how to love anybody else? How do you love him even if you did know how to properly love a human? Next, we see Judas alone in the desert. After a moment of letting Sam slip through his fingers, which is like an image of how desperate the situation is in his mind, we see tanks cresting over the hill, coming down straight towards him. They drive Judas on towards the camera, and this is all done with stripped back scores of music until the tanks suddenly burst into sound. Norman Jewison said this was to emphasize the enormity of the pressure of this choice on Judas. May I also suggest that the use of tanks amid the anti-war feelings of this time probably was not incidental. The threat of war is what is driving Judas's motivation in this film. I may even go so far as to say, uh, this might be controversial in itself to say it, Perhaps Judas's fear was something akin to the Holocaust. After all, we do see the mass persecution of Christians sometime shortly after the events that this story covers. Judas comes to the Pharisees, telling them that he's willing to help, but he's bothered by the choice to do so. Yet he's sure that Jesus also thinks things have gone too far, and even goes as far as saying Jesus wouldn't mind that he'd come to them. He says he hadn't considered any reward. In fact, he's not even really there by his own choice, but through the situation. This line makes sense because the Gospels actually agree with him. Judas did not just turn Jesus in. The Gospels say that a demon entered into him. Perhaps the tanks, perhaps his fear, represents that demon. And there's going to be more on that in a moment, about the secularization of the idea of demons and how that influences the actor playing Judas. Again, that's the actor as a character, not Carl Anderson himself. Judas calls himself a prophet. Why are we the prophets? Why are we the ones who see the sad solution and know what must be done? He repeatedly tries to reason with the Pharisees why he's there, but always ultimately comes back to the same question. Just don't say I'm damned for all time. He knows the possibility of his actions having quote-unquote eternal consequences, not in the next life, but in this life, that his name would become mud as a result of this, that his actions could resound throughout all of history, and of course, they do. The Pharisees give Judas money, but Judas says he doesn't want their blood money. However, they appeal to his better nature, saying, think of all the poor people you could help with the money we're giving you. You don't have to keep it for yourself. And that very thing is what he criticized Mary for not doing with the oil earlier. So reluctantly, he takes the bag of silver and tells them to look for Jesus Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane. A chorus of ghostly voices sing, Well done, Judas. Good job, Judas. Like a, a ghostly depiction of the multitude, the world, every person even, who has in one way or another betrayed Jesus or paid off someone to get Jesus out of their lives. And when I say Jesus, I mean what Jesus is, what he represents, the truth, the way, the life. Maybe not even by name, but we all try to destroy or kill the truth in our lives in one way or another at some point. A very abrupt cut occurs, which shows jets flying over Judas. It looks almost like they just avoided hitting him by, by inches, the way it's framed. This is a counterpoint to the tanks that began this thing. Judas feels that the crisis has been averted for what he's done. He's just barely missed out on the consequences. Next, we begin what in the stage show is Act 2, as the apostles go into the garden to eat the Last Supper. Jesus washes their hands rather than their feet, 
Uh, but this is a good way of showing Jesus serving them, always acting as a servant rather than the king he truly is. It's a change from washing the apostles' feet, and of course there's no dialogue from the Bible that went along with the feet washing. But it doesn't require rewriting the music to fit in a moment that was not including the stage show, yet it gets across that idea, and the idea is truly what matters in a production like this. When they all sit down, the men very deliberately strike the pose of the characters in Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Again, this moment would just be goofy if you tried to see it as Jesus and the Apostles. But when you see it as a cast of normal old Joes off the street, reinventing and reinvestigating the traditions of their past, this becomes a profound moment. This is what their parents told them the Last Supper was. This very elegant, genteel facade created by Western culture. This is going to become far removed from that as possible. But they have to start with the previous established cultural framework in order to investigate. Even though the setting is ridiculously different, they're out in a grove of olive trees. This represents, I think, how Norman Jewison thought we should be deconstructing. Deconstructionists, uh, a lot of the time, they just like to tear down. But the thing is, you can't do the Karl Marx routine where you tear down and tear down and tear down and then you're in a pile of rubble and you've destroyed everything. You have to tear down with the effort to rebuild, to find out what were the essential elements, what made that work, where did we go wrong with it before? The idea should not be deconstructionism as much as reconstructionism. Start with what worked undo it, and then redo it to see what you need to keep and what you need to throw out. Christianity at this point in time is kind of going through a deconstruction. But what is really lovely to see with all these revivals and stuff that have been breaking out is that we seem to be reconstructing, building on the idea that God is love. Remember, a lot of problems in Christianity came from when we forgot the essential principles of the New Testament that God is love. Not that God is loving, but God is love. Love is the substance of God himself, and so everything God does and says must be loving. Anything, for instance, in the Old Testament that doesn't seem like God is being loving, you have to read that with Christ in mind. Come back to it with the interpretation that God is love, deconstruct, and then reconstruct to see where we went wrong in our interpretations. That was a little bit of a tangent, but, and I know, like, this is like a three-second part of the movie that I'm focusing on right now, but it really has profound implications when you're considering that these people are not the characters, but actors who are trying to understand where their culture went wrong before and reconstruct something better out of it. Jesus gives them the wine and the bread, saying, at first, for all you care, this could be my body, and this could be my blood. Again, that deconstructionism. Get down to the essence. What could Jesus be saying? What is Ted seeing in the text as he's interpreting these lines? For all you care, I know how the, en the end of the story goes. You guys abandon me. You're all going to abandon me if I continue playing this role. So for all you care... I could be as worthless as a piece of bread or a, or a cup of cheap wine. But then he returns to the roots. Now he has stated some idea of the meaning. Jesus trying to implement an institution that will have his sacrifice remembered throughout all time. Then he repeats the lines again. This is my blood you drink. This is my body you eat. By reiterating the lines and saying, if you would remember me when you eat and drink. Grapes, fruit, fruit of the earth, bread, the, the staple of all societies throughout all of history has been bread. The largest f source of food at one point in time was bread. That was where people got most of their calorie intake. He is essentially making himself as essential as the basics of the diet. People back then didn't drink a lot of water. Water was contaminated. It was, not, it was hard to find clear you know, drinking water. So they tended to drink almost nothing but wine because the alcohol would kill any disease. Now, they didn't understand germ theory, but they had an idea of how alcohol worked. 
as Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, Judas is taking a bite of the bread and he pauses and closes his eyes, uh, almost in regret, but it also shows his realization of the importance of this institution of remembrance. Even as he is about to betray Jesus, Jesus offers him the chance to consume, uh, depending on your tradition, his body and blood, spiritually, physically, maybe it's just a symbol, but, but it's a profound symbol because Paul later says that if you eat and drink from, from the table, uh, for, uh, from the communion table, without discerning the body of Christ, then you drink judgment on yourself. So it's an important thing. And Judas has the realization of the importance of this institution, just like Ted does. Jesus, Ted, breaks the tradition at this point. He begins crying out that they're going to forget him, and they've missed the entire point of his life. Even pointing out that Peter is about to deny him, and one of them is about to betray him. Unlike in the Gospels, Judas stands up, breaking the tradition himself, and begins fighting with Jesus. Judas even lunges at him and says he despises Jesus, but Jesus calls him a liar. Interestingly, although this is in the score to the show as well, this movie makes sense of one of the oddest lines in the libretto. Jesus says, You liar, you Judas. Not you, comma, Judas, like he's addressing him, but as if Judas is already a name ubiquitous with betrayal. Again, historically, that really makes no sense. But in this film, it makes perfect sense. Ted is calling Carl, uh, not his character's name, but his character's role. In an effort to escape his role, realizing he doesn't truly want it if it leads to the death of his friend, Judas says, you wanted me to do it, what if I just stayed here and ruin your ambition? This points out the play-acted nature of all this. Jesus, Ted's ambition, is to live the, the Christ life. He wants his death ultimately to fulfill the role. This is emphasized even more when Ted calls Judas a fool, you fool, although the real Jesus said not to call each other fools. I know I've quoted the truth and beauty a few times, but uh, this there's a reason. Because this book, it's a great book, first off. I'm not sponsored or anything, but I'm just saying it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, it really changed my point of view on Western culture. Because there's a line in it where uh, the author, Andrew Clavin, says, if you uh, think about it, Western society, all societies really, are people performing a play. We're putting on costumes and assuming certain roles, and we're all putting on an organized play, which is primarily improv, but runs within the boundaries of a scenario. It might be the only movie I've ever seen that actually gets across such an abstract idea in such a solid and understandable way. As Judas leaves, he stops to compose himself, shivering slightly. Jesus pursues him and offers him a blanket, perhaps visually asking him to stay and bed down with the apostles for the night. Judas smacks the blanket out of his hand and says, You sad, pathetic man, see where you brought us to. Our ideals die around us, and all because of you. But the saddest cut of all is someone had to turn you in like a common criminal, like a wounded animal, like a jaded mandarin. This is clearly lashing out in anger, but again, Judas clearly knows what is about to happen. In this production, this is not Judas being angry with their ideals dying, as the words suggest. Watch Carl Anderson's brilliant performance and you can see these words are meant to be cutting and hurtful. Ted Neely even shakes his head and looks on the verge of tears. The argument heats up again as Jesus screams for him to get out. Judas responds, Every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let the things you did get so out of hand. You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned. As Judas's song dissolves into a groan of anguish, he touches Jesus' face, and Jesus almost touches his. Judas takes Jesus' hand, looks into Ted's hand, and cries out before running away. It's almost like he remembers what is about to happen to Ted's hands if he continues down this path. I think one of the most brilliant moments in this film is right after this. I mean, the very next shot. 
As Judas runs off, he runs into a pack of goats who are all fleeing in the same direction with him. Jesus watches tearfully, hands still outstretched, as though not willing to give up that Judas might come back, but realizing that Judas has left his life forever. It's powerful visual storytelling. Judas is choosing to run off with the goats who, in the New Testament, represent those who reject Christ. Ted, who is the one in the Jesus role, feels the loss of Judas, but also the loss of his friend. Remember, that's the point. By putting on the Jesus role, he will experience life through the eyes of Christ. When Christians lose a friend, we should see in that the loss Christ experienced when his friends abandoned him, or when Lazarus died and he wept at his tomb. Ted Neely continues, again, to keep his hand outstretched after Judas as he departs, and it's a powerful, rich little moment, just enveloped in subtext. The sun sets and Jesus goes off to pray alone. He sings the show-stopping number Gethsemane, in which Jesus begs for God to take the cup of suffering away from him. Where Christians often have issues with this song is how Jesus seems doubtful, as if he doesn't fully understand the plan for the resurrection. I'll admit, if this is the real Jesus, it's definitely got some issues, but if it is a man who is playing the role of Jesus, trying to find the truth by living the Logos life, then this song becomes an anthem for every religious person who ever lived. Quote, Then I was inspired. Now I'm sad and tired. Listen, surely I've exceeded expectations. Tried for three years. Seems like 30. Could you ask as much from any other man? Again, this is literally a man acting the Logos life. So he's asking this genuinely. Is this sort of dying to self, is this sort of loss to achieve the inner kingdom of life really something God would ask from just any other man, any normal man, besides Jesus himself? Why should I die? Would I be more noticed than I ever was before? And the answer is yes, of course, you will be more noticed, like a city on a hill. <laughs> See how I fit that in there, that little reference? Smooth as glass, huh? And he asks, if I die, what will be my reward? I'd have to know, have to know, my Lord. Well, the answer, of course, is the reward is life in the kingdom of heaven, which the real Christ said is within you. Why should I have to lose things in order to, to, to achieve this process and give up certain things in life in order to achieve the kingdom life? I want God to make me a new creation, but is it going to be worth the loss? These are legitimate questions. Then Jesus sings, all right, I'll die. See how I die. He reiterates this over and over as the music builds to a crescendo, and then he almost yells the words, just watch me die. Now we cut to the only part of the movie that was not shot on location in Israel. The only part that was not specifically made for the film. Icons and paintings of the crucifixions throughout the centuries, especially focusing on the tears of Christ and his looks of anguish. Then we cut back to Ted, who is praying. This is another beautiful little cultural moment. Because he's never gone through the process of truly dying to himself in this Christ role that he's playing, Ted's only frame of reference, much like Mary's, is what he's seen in his life. And what has he seen in his life? Paintings in church, paintings in museums, the iconic depictions of crucifixions. Nothing real because Ted Neely has never seen a actual crucifixion happen in real life. As a, a Texan-born American, he's just never seen that happen in real life. So, when he is thinking about the concept, we cut to the iconic Western art Jesus, as an archetype, is going back to what his parents and society have taught him. This adds another layer of subtext to him not understanding the full reason for dying yet. Because he hasn't done it. He hasn't been resurrected in the Christ life yet. He's only experiencing the death. And so he's asking for that clarity. Lord, show me the reason you want me to do this. And then thinking about the horror of those images which maybe for the first time that western art has come to life for him showing him uh, the true horror of crucifixion that is being depicted 
Why then am I scared to finish what I started? Then Ted pauses and says, What you started, I didn't start it. With that realization, he has the strength to submit to God's will. He realizes that this is bigger than him. Uh, this is something that I think is the reason why so many men have been turning to uh, uh, sort of uh, a lot of self, uh, self-help and, and a lot of people who are trying to bring back the traditional views and ideas of masculinity in Western culture is because a lot of men don't have anything bigger than themselves. And so they end up spending a lot of their time uh, wasting time, you know, not really knowing what to do with their lives and, uh, and not really knowing who they are in their society. And so when somebody tells them, actually, there's a role that you're meant to play, uh, it, it really unchains them. It, it makes them almost enlightened because they're like, I do have a place in the society. Hot dang. You know, I think I said earlier that this next lyric was changed in subsequent versions to God, thy will be done. Kill your only son. And to be sure, if this was the real Jesus, that makes more sense. But if it isn't, if it is just a man following Christ's footsteps, then the next line makes far more sense as it was written. God, thy will is hard, but you hold every card. I will drink your cup of poison. Nail me to your cross and break me. Bleed me, beat me, kill me. Take me now before I change my mind. This submission is hard, and every religious person knows how this feels. The fear in knowing God's will might be unpleasant for you, but submitting anyway. And I don't know about you, but I've certainly prayed the prayer, Lord, if you're going to do this, do it now before I change my mind. And, and before I, I, I'm not ready anymore, just please, just let's get this over with. And, and a lot of the time, the Lord has actually answered that prayer for me personally. We're suddenly back in the garden as if the song took place in Jesus' head. It even dissolves back to Jesus. Judas kisses Jesus' cheek, and Jesus asks, uh, Must you betray your master with a kiss? Peter and, and the apostles wake, and they're surrounded by soldiers. They start to fight, but Jesus tells the soldiers to put away their swords. And the soldiers actually listen to him. It's a subtle way of showing the power Jesus has, uh, but it also shows the play-acted nature of this whole scene. These guys are probably friends in real life, so he listens to Ted. In the Gospels, Christ actually told Peter to put away his swords, and this is the way it is retained in most stage versions. He says this line to Peter, not the soldier. In the next scene, as Jesus is taken to trial, he's interviewed by paparazzi. One guy actually says, you'll escape in the final reel. Again, these lyrics are in the show, but when you put them in this context, it's amazing how they show the fakery that Norm Jewison intended to get across. The world is badgering him through the paparazzi, asking him questions, how did this happen, demanding answers, asking what his mistakes were, how he ended up in this situation. And some, like this final real guy, they have a desire for a happy ending despite the odds. The Pharisees interview Jesus and ask him if he's the son of God. Jesus says, that's what you say. You say that I am. Of course, in the real trial, Jesus says this, but he also admits to being the Son of God and says they will see him coming on the clouds. But Ted simply states that they have assigned him this role. Annas tells Judas to stay a while, and they, he might even see Jesus bleed, which disturbs Judas, who realizes they are not going to just arrest him and put a stop to the movement. They are going to kill him. Again, this is kind of inconsistent because Judas seems to imply he knows what's going to happen. But that's the beauty of this interpretation. Because Judas does know what's going to happen, but he's play-acting the shock. Peter denies Jesus at a well nearby and justifies it by saying that the mob might have killed him too. Meanwhile, the lead singer of Greta Van Fleet, uh, I mean John the Beloved, and Mary watch. Mary points out that Jesus predicted this very thing would happen and wonders how he knew about it. Again, this is a supernatural element that's kept intact in the stage show, and there is no other explanation other than Jesus is who he says he is. But in the film, it's because Jesus knows the story. By living the Christ life, he has been informed through the scriptures what will happen. Mary, who is only in the beginnings of a relationship with Jesus, not even sure how to love him as her God, cannot fully understand yet. By the way, Ted's character being informed by the scriptures makes perfect sense in living the Christ life because, think about it, how often did Jesus justify the things that were happening by saying, this has to happen to fulfill the scriptures? Quite a clever and subtle little element. 
They take Jesus to Pilate. Barry Dennen seems to have so much fun playing this character, and I've always really enjoyed his performance. It's also funny that, apparently, he was the only Jew in the main cast, yet he played the only non-Jewish character. Pilate is familiar with Jesus, but Jesus won't answer if he's the king of the Jews. Pilate asks how Jesus can be so quiet and cool about his fate, before saying that Jesus is a Galilean, he should be taken to Herod. Your Herod's race, your Herod's case. As he says this, Barry Denon chooses to play this little moment as looking into Jesus' face and suddenly becoming fearful and walking back up the stairs quickly, as though for just a moment he realizes Jesus is the Galilean from his dream in Act 1. The next scene is Herod's song. Herod is played by Josh Mostel, the son of the brilliant Zero Mostel. He is a fanboy of Jesus who requests Jesus to perform a multitude of miracles. And when he does not do it, Herod becomes angry and screams at Jesus that he's not who he thinks he is and he should get out of his life. This gives Jesus a good reason for never responding to Herod. In this version, he simply is not going to respond to the ridicule. It's also interesting again to point out that the lines from the show retain the supernatural miracles as having happened. Herod mentions multiplying bread, walking on water, and turning water into wine. But this ridicule in Norman Jewison's vision may also be to represent the ridicule of religious people by others. Or even those who want to be religious, but only because of the hope of some supernatural miracle. To live the religious role of Christ, one will meet with those who will demand miracles and other silly tests because they are not willing to just disagree or to look into the evidence and have some faith for what they can't prove. They have to demean instead. Herod actually met some controversy, <laughs> imagine that, a part of this show being controversial, who'd have thought? But Herod in the stage show was a drag queen, and this was seen as an offensive stereotyping, and Norman Jewison apparently agreed. Mr. O'Horgan, who staged it and directed it, I think he characterized some of the characterizations were a little uh, offensive. Here, Herod seems like a fat, rich kid with a big gold chain. However, he's allowed to be flamboyant and have a very flamboyant men in his entourage. However, there's nothing offensive about the implication of him being gay. After all, Barry Dennen, who plays Pilate, is gay in real life, and he simply plays his character, Pilate, as a gay man. And that's okay. Nobody is, uh, nobody has, to the best of my knowledge, ever made a big deal of that. If you want to say it's offensive stereotyping, well then you should have told Barry Dennen to stop acting the way he acts. I mean, he acts that way in interviews, too. It's, it's just Barry Dennen. <laughs> After Herod, the only intentionally comedic relief moment in the show, Jesus is taken back to his cell. Mary and Peter see Jesus standing out in a distance. They sing the song, Could We Start Again? Both of them say that Jesus has gone too far and asks to start over, to go back like it used to be. Obviously, it can never be the same. Jesus, Ted, will not return. The option is only that they follow him in his role, or they have to part ways. There is no going back for Ted. This is shown by Ted continually turning around to them and making a welcoming gesture, welcoming them to join him. But he has to keep walking. He walks a few yards, turns back to them. Walks a few yards, turns back to them. But he never comes back to where he started. He can't go back. At this point, they have to follow, or not. The entire cast seems to show up, standing on the mountaintop, and watching Jesus walk out of focus. They have to make their choice, and they have. They've chosen not to follow him. Judas runs to the Pharisees and rants to them that Jesus has been beaten far too severely. He's three quarters dead, and it's inhumane. However, he follows it up by adding, and I know who everybody's going to blame. Yet... He does seem genuinely repentant by adding, I'd save him all his suffering if I could. The Pharisees encourage him and tell him that his actions will be the saving of everyone. This is a moment of severe irony because actually Judas's actions, literally, if you believe in Christianity, were the saving of everyone. If that demon hadn't entered him and driven him to do it, Jesus would not have been able to die for us. Somebody had to betray him in order for him to be put to death as the sacrifice for all our sins. 
So, funny enough, his actions were the salvation of everyone. It just wasn't the way he intended. As Judas drops to his knees to pray, Caiaphas even pats his shoulder to comfort him. It keeps the characters very human, again, even in their most evil moments. Judas tries to justify his choice at first, before finally saying he'd rather sell out the nation than be saddled with the murder of Christ. He knows his name will be mud after this. Then Judas does the famous reprise. I don't know how to love him. I don't know why he moves me. He's a man. He's just a man. He's not a king. He's just the same as anyone I know. There's that justifying his actions again, but then he adds, he scares me so. When he's cold and dead, will he let me be? Does he love me too? Does he care for me? This is really heart-wrenching because Judas can't find redemption because he does not understand the truth of divine love. Forgiveness for what he's done is unthinkable. Does Jesus love me? The fact that he has to, to question that is already his death sentence. Remember, Jesus predicts that it would have been better for the man who betrayed him that he would never have been born. Well, I can guarantee you anybody who has ever felt such regret for an action that they committed suicide, it would have been better for that person to have never been born than to feel that level of regret. Promise you. And the fear that Jesus may even haunt him for his actions after his death, the fear of losing the brotherly love they had becoming a malignant haunting is too much for him to bear. The musical change with the ticking clock symbolizes Judas' realization of what he's done and that his time on this earth is limited. Judas reprises his opening lines, but now changed. Instead of, my mind is clear now, he sings, my mind is in darkness. He screams out that God has used him and chose him to commit a crime on God's behalf. He screams to God, you have murdered me, as he uses his belt to hang himself. The effect used to show Judas hanging, by the way, is fantastic and it really holds up. Now Judas blaming God before killing himself makes perfect sense, sense in our analytical interpretation. He represents the voice of all those deconstructing the story. He's the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy at the beginning of the film. You'll be lost and you'll be so sorry when I'm gone. Deconstructionists rip down everything to the foundation and then destroy the foundation. And a long-standing myth of Christianity has been the misinterpretation that Judas was predestined to betray Jesus. Coming down to this view of the character he plays, Judas' actor has come to the conclusion that Judas was set up by God. That it was not a demon who possessed him, but rather it was the predestined Calvinistic idea that God actually created Judas as a vessel of wrath. At first, Judas chooses to play, or his actor chooses to play, the character as naturalistic. The forces of war and anxiety and what could happen to his nation. All of these things, he chooses to play these things as the reason for trading in Jesus. But without the supernatural in the form of a demon, he comes down to the point where he believes that God himself has set him up. At rock bottom, the denial of the supernatural leads back to the supernatural. This rock bottom interpretation allows Judas to seek his escape from his role, not because of his guilt as the real Judas did, but because of the characterization of Western society that his character has led him to believe that Judas was an innocent who was betrayed by God rather than someone who was possessed and betrayed God himself. It's an inversion. It's uh, the sort of inversion of morals that we see Hollywood perform over and over and over again. Remember, he says, if you strip away the myth from the man, this interpretation includes stripping away demonic possession, and therefore Judas must have been a tool in God's game. And this same logical fallacy has led so many Calvinist denominations of Christians to become atheists. So many Calvinist Christians turn to atheism because they cannot fathom that the mercy of God uh, could exist when that same God created someone just to condemn them for actions that they could not reasonably choose. Judas's actor has the same epiphany, but more on that in a minute. 
As he hangs dead, the choir of the world sings, So long, Judas, just as they had sung, Well done, Judas. I always took this to mean that they have gotten what they wanted, and so they can condemn him as many Christians have for centuries. The fact that many condemn Judas, just as they condemn Adam or the Pharisees, shows a real lack of self-awareness. The truth is obvious to anyone who comes to the story with an open heart. We all betrayed and murdered the truth because that's who we are. If Jesus came to earth today as a mortal man, it would be exactly the same. We would kill him just the same today as we did 2,000 years ago. The Pharisees tell Pilate they need Jesus crucified, and Pilate instantly becomes uncomfortable. Perhaps this is because Barry, the actor, is realizing the truth of the role he's been cast in. Pilate demands Jesus to speak to him. Where is your kingdom? Jesus responds that he has no kingdom in this world, but there may be a kingdom for him somewhere if you only knew. Then you are a king, Pilate says. Jesus says, you say I am. I look for truth and find that I get damned. This is another great moment of clarity for our interpretation. Jesus here doesn't say, my kingdom is not of this world, as Christ says in the Bible. He simply states, the kingdom is the hope that he has and that he is looking for truth. Not that he is the truth, like Christ, or that he even speaks the truth. He is just looking for truth in the character of Jesus. Gosh, I love that about this way of viewing this movie. You can see the surface level of a slightly iconoclastic retelling of the story of Jesus, but you can also see different people reenacting roles that they have played throughout centuries, uh, which they typically play within society, and they're just interpreting them through the roles of biblical characters. Gosh, I love this movie. It's so clever. Pilate asks, what is truth? The question that in the Bible hangs in the air. But here he adds... We both have truths. Are mine the same as yours? This was starting in society uh, in the 50s, uh, coming into its, into its prime in the 70s, and of course now it's rampant in our culture. Your truth, my truth. We all have different truths. My truths are different than your truths, and we can disagree. But that's not true. It's not true. This relativism is destroying Western society. That is a type of deconstructionism that is actually bad, and we see in the character of Pilate how the deconstructionism of, of people like Judas is spreading so that he can't see that Jesus is the truth, that the Christ life, the Logos life, the godly life, that it is the truth. Instead, he questions, are my truths the same as your truths? He almost scoffs it, but there's something about Dar Barry Dinan's performance that, that makes you think, Barry is actually asking this question as a legit question, even as he is saying it in a slightly uh, demeaning way. Pilate is that character we see a lot, by the way. He won't condemn Jesus. Not directly. He won't say that he's crazy or bad, at least not at first until he gets pressed, just that he didn't do anything wrong. He was a great religious teacher who didn't deserve what he got. I always loved this part where the crowd starts chanting, We have no king but Caesar, and Pilate sings, What is this? Respect for Caesar. Till now, this has been noticeably lacking. I think that's a great line, and the way Barry Denon speaks the line actually always really makes me smile. Like, he really relishes that line. I love how Pilate asks, Who is this Jesus? Why is he different? He asks that to the crowd, and Jesus looks up at him, almost hoping Pilate's actor and his character, might see the truth and be saved. That he might also play the Jesus character by sacrificing his life to the crowd in selfless love of the right and the good and the beautiful rather than giving in to the crowd. It's a very subtle moment. Pilate demands Jesus to talk to him. Jesus doesn't speak, but the, the I Dreamed I Met a Galilean song plays again as an instrumental track. Pilate says Jesus is mad, and Jesus bows his head in defeat, knowing that Pilate is not going to choose the right. Knowing that Pilate has chosen his character and to truly play his role, rather than to join Ted in the Christ life. Pilate orders Jesus flogged. The 39 stripes are counted out in this film, and it's a brutal scene. Mary screaming like it's a horror movie, it's horrific. And Ted Neely is really taking these impacts from the whip, too. 
don't worry, the whip is made of a soft material. It's not hurting him. And they do play with the speed by ramping it up or slowing it down, cutting away at key moments to make the impact look harder than it is. But it's a very well put together scene, and the music building, it, it becomes hard to watch, actually. Pilate asks, where are you from, Jesus? What do you want, Jesus? Tell me. Why do you not speak when I hold your life in my hands? Pilate's almost tearful. He's, he's almost can't stand Jesus' silence anymore. It calls to mind that dream where it was very frustrating to him and disturbing to him that the Galilean would not answer him. He picks up Jesus in his arms tenderly. And Jesus tells him he has no power. Everything is fixed and you can't change it. Pilate drops him, pleading Jesus to help him help him. Pilate's hands are covered in blood from Jesus' back. As the crowd closes in, getting louder and louder, Pilate washes the blood from his hands. Screaming, Pilate tells Jesus that he won't stop his great self-destruction. Die if you want to, you misguided martyr. Die if you want to, you innocent puppet. Here's where it all comes together. Suddenly we are in a pantheon, an empty pantheon, except for Jesus standing on the stage. He turns around and we see the stripes on his back and his old robe disappear. He is now dressed in a blindingly white robe. His hair, which was messy, is now beautifully parted and his hands are raised in a holy gesture. He has become the Christ from the paintings, the Christ that is depicted in the resurrection in silently fulfilling his role, running with diligence the race, fulfilling the role he was meant to play in accepting his condemnation, has become the image of Christ that he represents. This film is the right way to question culture, reconstructing rather than deconstructing. Jesus doesn't start off as the non-relatable, demigod-like figure that we see in Western art. Jesus becomes the glowing Godhead by his condemnation. He doesn't start off as the popular cultural image of Jesus. He starts out as a man, a regular guy. And by his death, Ted achieves the ultimate understanding of his character and becomes the holy figure. By taking us with him, we understand Jesus in a new way. We are crucified with Christ by being crucified with Christ, dying to self, we rise in the character of Christ. We must decrease. Ted's character, the real Ted that shines through this movie, must decrease over time so that Christ can increase. And at the end, he achieves the ultimate, what culturally we would typically say, the ultimate enlightenment. He becomes enlightened because in living out the Christ life fully and accepting his martyrdom in the small ways. Again, this is all symbolic. Accepting his death to self, he is glorified. He becomes Christ to other people. In this case, he becomes Christ to us, the audience. Next, Carl comes back in. Notice I don't say Judas. Some interpret this wrongly, and primarily I think they do it so that they can be offended over something else in the film, that Judas is resurrected at the end while Jesus remains dead. And this is simply wrong. You're just wrong if you think that. Carl is now playing the actor who played Judas. And his choir represents the deconstructionists, asking questions we all must answer and pleading not to be taken wrong, despite the fact that the meaning of these questions is exactly the belittling way in which Carl is asking them. But the answer is cleverly presented before the questions are even asked. They are asking the questions to the answer. Asking, what is the achievement that Jesus sought to achieve to the achievement? Ted becoming the character of Christ. Why did you come when you did, Jesus? If you'd come today, you would have reached far more people. The choir mockingly asks, Jesus Christ Superstar, do you think you are who they say you are? Judas says, hey Jesus, 
What do you think about B Buddha and Muhammad? Are they where you at? Are you where they are? Are you just one teacher among many? Did you mean to die like that? Or was it just a, a phenomenal fluke? Or did you just know your message would be a record breaker and you were willing to die for it? Sure, I'm being condescending, but please, don't, don't you get me wrong. Don't you get me wrong. Don't you get me wrong. Jesus Christ Superstar, in short, is the ultimate answer to a time period questioning who Jesus is. Iconoclastic, sure, in order to reorder Jesus. All deconstruction requires iconoclasm. It just does. You have to get beyond the image that culture has built up in order to find the truth. Because, of course, the image of, of the Western culture Jesus is not truly Jesus. Just read the Gospels and you see an entirely different man than the one we get represented to us. And so in order to restore Jesus as a, the pristine images we saw in the paintings of Gethsemane and the pristine image of Ted Neely standing on the stage, we have to get to the point where we see him as just a man first and realize what made him so special. All of this is intercut with Jesus carrying the cross. And finally, the song Carl is singing ends. It kind of just stops, a little bit like Judas's first song, as he cries out for Jesus to listen to him, now he cries out for Jesus to answer him. Finally, as the song ends, Jesus is crucified, amid the ghostly, mocking, and laughing voice of his detractors. He asks God to forgive them, as the real Jesus did, again fulfilling and living into his role. The soldiers all look at each other in confusion when he does this. Several of Jesus' final words are in this scene as the eclectic and almost anxiety-inducing music swells. It sounds strangely like the Ligeti music from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Jesus finally says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. As he dies, the music dies too for a moment. As the music to Gethsemane starts up, the actors all leave Ted on the cross. They simply walk away. They come back down and start boarding the bus. They've seen what they want to see. They're not really interested in looking further than the crucifixion. I think perhaps this is meant to be interpreted that they thought something would happen. They thought they would achieve some level of truth by seeing the crucifixion or, or some sort of spectacle. As they leave, most of the cast is laughing. They seem happy, uh, maybe a little sad that it's over, but in a wistful, smiling way. The exceptions are Peter, who looks a little bit down, Barry Dinan, who gets on the bus but regretfully looks off towards the cross before entering. And Mary also looks off towards the cross in a sad way, then looks behind her at Judas, almost unsure of what to think of him, and then enters. Judas, however, looks to the cross before he gets on the bus, even putting his hands on his hips and giving this look that sort of is like, I knew it was all bullcrap. But at the same time, when he actually gets up on the bus, he also looks like he doesn't really know how to feel about the situation. Suddenly, the bus drives away. Jesus, Ted Neely, is not with them. A cost has really been paid in order to ask these questions and to deconstruct, to get these answers. They lost their friend Ted. And now, going back to society, what will they do now that they've successfully killed Jesus? After all, Judas himself looks very confused. He's played his role, and yet now that he's gotten rid of Judas, strangely, for the first time in the film, he's speechless. He doesn't have any more questions. He doesn't have any more demands for answers, because they've murdered the answer. How do you live with that? There's really nothing to do but to go home a little sadder and a little wiser. And while most of them have missed the point, still, there remain a few who got it. The rest go home laughing. The final shot shows a cross on a hill as the sun sets. There is no victim on this cross. It is an empty cross, which I believe was a hint at a type of resurrection. Let me make my case for that. It may not literally be the actor Ted Neely. In fact, I've heard that it was actually not planned that this was a coincidence. A shepherd walks up the hill leading his sheep towards the cross as the sun sets. Now, it may not literally be the actor Ted Neely who plays Jesus, but it does represent Jesus, the shepherd leading his sheep, leading those who will follow him. 
Jesus' walking away from Mary and Peter and the others in the desert, gesturing for them to follow him, but they don't. Well, now, as a result of his death and being freed of the cross through some unknown means, again, we don't see, uh, we, we don't see the resurrection in this, but by being removed from the cross and resurrected, Ted has found the truth. And he is leading other people because he, again, he became Christ to us within the context of the movie, right? Now he's leading other people like us to the cross, leading other people to say, this cross, this is not just a symbol of faith. This is a way of life. You have to accept your cross and die too. Die to yourself. Die every day a little bit more in order to become a little bit more like Christ. By accepting his cross and emulating Jesus, Ted understands. Through suffering and death on the cross, he cannot go back to his own life, his old way of life. This is why he doesn't get on the bus with them. In a way, he is resurrected as the character of the shepherd. The shepherd, of course, is the film itself. He is resurrected through others taking the message of redemption from this show and spreading the good news. However, he can never go back, and so the bus leaves without him. The shot fades out, and the credits roll in utter silence. I hope that I've made you look at this film differently. If you come to it and see this movie even, even as slightly more profound than you did, if maybe uh, you loved the film, but it, it makes you see it in a different way, or if you hated the film and you're willing to give it another chance now, I hope in some way that this video has blessed you. I, I hope that you don't just see this as me being conspiratorial or reading into this way too much. I hope you'll accept that this is at least an interpretation that's a possibility and give it a chance in your own watching. And after you see the film again, go in the comments below and, and let me know if you see what I see. And if you already thought about this and thought about this interpretation, then let me know too. And if I've missed anything that you thought about, let me know too, because I'd love to learn more about other people's feelings on this film. It's a profoundly underrated film. It is a cult film. It does have a following, but I think this actually is one of the best films like ever. I love this film. I think it is so profound and so deeply rich in its subtext. And I, I, I really love it, and I love sharing it with people. So thank you all for watching this video. God bless you, and I will see you in the next one.